we say the rebel forces, given the time frame that we are talking about, did exactly the same thing. It took about 50 years for Westchester to recover from that. Since I've mentioned the farm holdings of Jonathan O'Dell, I should mention that at the time, uh, this part of Westchester was located inside a British land grant to be called Philipsburg Manor. And everybody who farmed on that was therefore a tenant farmer basically working for the crown. If I was actually going to go a little bit further back in history, I would start talking about the Lenape people who used to hunt on this land. But of course, by the time of this history that we're talking about, they become largely irrelevant uh, to this narrative. In 1779, the current uh, uh, land Holder, Phillips, uh, Frederick Phillips III was attainted for treason. Now, in case you are as ignorant of the, the word attainted as I was when I first started doing research for this talk, what that means is that he was tried and convicted of treason in absentia without giving a chance for him to defend himself. And the New York State confiscated that property. In 1785, Phillipsburg Manor was finally broken up and sold to local farmers, including Jonathan O'Dell, who now had the opportunity to own the land which he, he and his family have been farming for so long. In 1780, a little bit before the Revolutionary War ended, Alexander Hamilton marries Elizabeth Schuyler. You might want to remember that last name. It's going to be popping up later in this talk. This painting was uh, made in 1789, as you can see here, and presumably Elizabeth Schuyler uh, posed for it. This painting that was painted in 1806 was painted two years after Alexander Hamilton's death. So chances are there's a little bit of idealization uh, going on over here. Um, after the Revolutionary War was over, um, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and others worked towards the reopening of King's College, renaming it Columbia College, and remained on the Board of Trustees uh, until he passed away. So maybe he did deserve the statue after all. <laughs> Now that we've uh, followed the trail of Alexander Hamilton, let's start picking up the trail of his uh, third, uh, sorry, his third son and fourth child, James Alexander Hamilton. Um, he was born in 1788. He had two major tragedies in his young life. One, in 1801, James's older brother, Philip Hamilton, was killed in a duel. Um, his sister, Angelica, went insane as a result and she spent the next 60 years of her life uh, locked in a fantasy world in which her brother was still alive, in which she f refused mentally to grow any older. And then three years later, as I'm sure everybody knows, Alexander Hamilton was shot in the duel with Aaron Burr. Uh, by the way, this is some sort of 20th century recreation of some sort. It's uh, not very accurate. For one thing, uh, there was nobody else there. Um, there certainly wasn't any woman walking a child around uh, at the property. And also, all the participants in the duel, uh, the seconds and so forth, save one, turned their backs on the duel so they would have plausible deniability. Dueling was illegal in New Jersey, it was just less har harshly punished than it was in New York at the time. It's also unfortunately interesting to note that Alexander Hamilton, when he went to that duel, was going to the same spot and using the same dueling pistols that his son Philippe had used and was killed with uh, three years before. But despite this tragedy, the following year, James Hamilton graduated from Columbia College, which makes him firmly one of ours. The alumni committees, of course, still note this, and we occasionally get mail here uh, asking for donations in his name. <laughs> He uh, married Mary Morris, the gr uh, granddaughter of a Revolutionary War hero. And Alex, uh, rather than reading everything out loud, I'll simply say that James Hamilton inherited some of the boldness and spirit of his father, but not the opportunity to become a founding father. He did work in the highest levels of government, because, including being briefly uh, Secretary of State. But primarily, uh, what he uh, did in order to make a living is he was an attorney, a successful attorney, in. New York. So what do you do if you are a successful attorney in New York? You do exactly what you do now. You buy yourself an estate in Westchester. <laughs> 
1834, he purchased uh, a total of about 290 acres of property. You'll begin to see numbers here, which I've adjusted for inflation to 2015. I can't adjust them for 2016 because this year isn't over yet. Um, so you can see he paid half a million dollars for 300 acres. You know, that's not a bad deal for Westchester property, even by today's standards. But of course, it was completely undeveloped at the time. And the following year, the mansion house was constructed. It's an example of Greek revival architecture. We know it's 1835 because when we go to the mansion house for the wine and cheese afterwards, you will see 1835 uh, 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 right above the hallway. It's not like it's located on 1835 Broadway or anything like that. Here is a picture that was made in uh, 1850, 15 years later. And here we have to go to a little story here. Now, perhaps some of you are speed reading through this text. I'm going to give you the substance of it. Uh, this side of the Hudson River at the time was completely flat. It was all farmland after all. And what made this particular estate unique is that there was one single chestnut tree growing on the property. Now, Washington Irving was a good friend of the Hamilton family, and he made the suggestion, why not call the estate the Single Tree Hall? Uh, and they laughed at that, and the decision was made, though, by James Hamilton to name the estate uh, Nevis after the birthplace of his father. This picture, made 15 years later, shows something interesting. There's no longer a single tree uh, around uh, the mansion. There's this particularly tall tree up here, and it would be nice to think, well, maybe that's the single chestnut tree. Now, I am not a tree expert, but this does not look like a chestnut tree to me. This looks like it's a white pine. But it's nice to think about. Interestingly enough, if you go up to the mansion house and look around, you will find that there is a white pine in approximately this location relative to the mansion house.